My name is Khadijah Ali Coleman. That's me. I am 46 years old, and I have about 10 things I'm usually doing at once. I write plays and songs and get paid sometimes to share them with audiences. I teach community college, even though I'm taking a hiatus this semester. And that's because I got a new full-time job, and I homeschool this person, my daughter, Kari Isabel Soleil. This story is about her and me, and some examples of the positive impact of homeschooling black children. Why this story? Why me? Well, I am a credible source, I think. I earned my doctorate earlier this year during the blossoming of COVID-19. I literally defended my dissertation on Friday the 13th of March, which was when many schools and businesses closed to quarantine. I had to defend my dissertation through Google Hangout. My dissertation study is titled, Dual Enrolled African American Homeschool Students, Perceptions of Preparedness for Community College. My research entailed interviewing eight dual enrolled African American children who are between the ages of 14 and 17 years old and homeschooled for high school. They shared with me the ways that homeschooling helped prepare them for college. But I also learned that in many ways, homeschooling had a positive impact on them overall as human beings. So let me backtrack a bit and share with you how I got started homeschooling. When my daughter was born, I had lofty dreams that I'm sure a lot of you parents have of wanting the best for your child, which always means better than what you, the parent, had. Educationally, I hadn't had it so bad during the early part of my life, but my high school years really lacked, and I refer to them as the year I stopped loving learning. My mother moved us around a lot, but early on, the public and private schools she enrolled me in were pretty good. I went to the rigorous Pan-African Institute Nation House Watoto Shule in Washington, D.C. in the early 80s, and later I was in a great elementary school, Woodland Elementary, in Silver Spring, Maryland. A fun fact is that I was in fifth grade with Dave Chappelle. (laughs) But when my family moved to another county in Maryland, my love of school waned. In fact, I started to hate school. The new schools I attended were dull, restrictive, and lacked the cultural richness I was used to when I lived among people from various countries in the Caribbean, Africa, and South America. I skipped school regularly, although still making good grades, and struggled at home with my mother's abusive new husband. I had vowed that I was never raising a child in this place. However, after college and earning a master's degree in 2000, I was still living in this place by 2003 when my daughter was born. She was in daycare for her first three years because I had to work. I had a job in DC where I would literally have her at work with me most of the day because of a lenient boss. This was the start of me having her with me and having her part of whatever I was doing professionally. I got a job in 2006 at Morgan State University as Assistant Director of Residence Life in Baltimore and moved out there with her for two years. During those two years, she was in a pre-K program that was Montessori-like, where she was one of three black children in a class of about 16 kids. While the two teachers who ran the class were not overtly racist or demeaning, The class lacked a cultural richness that I find important for children to have. The teachers also reported to me issues they had with Kari, getting up when she felt like it, like if she had to use the bathroom or go to the writing station, etc. I had taught her to have self-agency very young, and this was not translating well in a school environment. In our house, since she could walk, I had little tables with paper and pencils or crayons for her to access throughout the day to draw or practice her writing. But in school, the regimented class schedule did not allow her to engage in this behavior. It was at this moment I started to become acutely aware of the way that schools really mute 
any type of agency children have over their bodies or their time. After two years, I moved back with Kari to the county I grew up with after leaving my job in Baltimore. When we returned, the public school system told us that our daughter was not old enough to start kindergarten. So I homeschooled her for about a year until I enrolled her in a private school for part of kindergarten and first grade before she went to public school for second, third, and fourth grade. It was in fourth grade when the decision to homeschool for good was cinched. So I began homeschooling Kari um, after fourth grade. Um, and what spurred it was an incident in particular where her fourth grade teacher um, reached out to me requesting a parent conference. And I'm thinking that, uh-oh, what did Kari do? You know, um, I knew that, um, and you know, previously she had, teachers had um, issues with her just really being um, self-aware. I need to go to the bathroom, I'm gonna go to the bathroom. So these things, but then, you know, not asking permission, things like that. I thought it was maybe along those lines. Well, the teacher informed me that Kari actually was finishing her work before everyone else. And they, the when she would finish, um, she would begin writing stories. And I knew at this point that she was a very engaged writer. Um, as soon as she pretty much learned how to read, she began writing. And so she had begun reading around four. And so she had been writing just as long. And so this was fourth grade. So she was, what, eight or nine? Um, and so the teacher said, asked me, would I ask her to stop writing? because it was uh, distracting the other students who weren't finished their work and they wanted to write stories too. And so at that moment, I was convinced that this was a very toxic environment for my daughter, who was a writer. And um, to be in a learning environment and um, have a teacher look at that as not being something that was impressive but in fact feeling entitled to call that, that child's parent and and plead this case of talking to her so that she will stop writing it was the most asinine um, conversation I've ever had with another educational professional this woman didn't know that I had been an educator myself for at this point over two decades but it was the most ridiculous and actually really dangerous um, sentiment I felt. And so I knew this would be her last year. Um, we're not going through this again. So for fifth and sixth grade, I homeschooled my daughter. We deschooled slowly because I found that there were certain structures she had in public school that could not be disrupted so easily at first. We finally segued into using some things that are commonly used in college, but allow for a more self-directed experience by the learner. Things like a syllabus, end of the week deadlines instead of daily de deadlines, and competency demonstrations through oral presentations, visual displays, and capstone projects instead of tests and quizzes. So yeah, in fifth grade, my child was using a syllabus <laughs> and really creating a schedule for herself. Where writing for pleasure and at will had been restricted throughout her school day previously, she really had the freedom to write when the spirit moved her. She was making doll houses out of boxes that she found laying around. She was refashioning clothing to craft into designs for her doll house. We signed her up for classes at different co-ops in our area. We were really getting our groove on as a homeschooling family. Near the end of sixth grade, she had really become a fan of YouTube. We used it for math when we used Khan Academy and she watched a lot of her crafting shows on there. She decided that she wanted to be a YouTuber. <laughs> when I had to outline what are some of the skills a YouTuber needs to be successful, one of the things she identified was a stage presence. 
the ability to memorize and then speak well. And so I began coaching her in these areas and told her she should consider auditioning locally to get feedback from casting directors and folks in that field to kind of build her confidence. Wishing Spell, and I chose that book because it's one of my favorite books. Um, my cake was a forest, and um, it was actually one of the forests in my book called The Door Forest. And that was one of, one of my favorite parts of the book was when they fell into the door forest, when they got sucked into the land of stories. Um, I'm 11. Um, I don't bake very often. Very recently, I made um, rum cake for um, a, a, um, for to make to um, sell at a market, and um, yeah. <laughs> She auditioned at a magnet school in our county to get the feedback and test her confidence during an audition process. This was at the end of what would be considered her sixth grade year. She wound up getting into the school and decided to attend for seventh grade. I was a bit sad. Our homeschooling was over, but I was happy for her. She did two years of middle school for seventh and eighth grade and asked me to homeschool her for high school. Her middle school experience had been bittersweet. She met amazing friends that she still has five years later, but the restrictive school environment was a bit much for her. Getting homeschooling, she decided for middle school she was going to go to this school. She went there for two years, and then um, she opted after eighth grade. She said, Mommy, I would like to be homeschooled again. And so that is what led her back to the fold. <laughs> Um, to be homeschooled and she these are some things that she had to say about the experience this might be intense but it was kind of like a dictatorship and it was just very like kind of since I'm an adult I can treat you in any way that I feel is right because I'm an adult and you're a child mm. and that wasn't like right for me so um yeah after after middle school i didn't really want to attend public school anymore we not, we, i didn't know so you know we never talked about that because you so for middle school you were in a performing arts school um and just for the record so the audience will know the performance arts school was very different than the environment that is general in our county where people have to wear uniforms. So in your middle school, you didn't have to wear a uniform. And it was really this impression, this first impression that you all were encouraged to have your own identity. Um, and it wasn't so restrictive, but what you're saying is that that wasn't necessarily the truth about it. Like, yeah, in some ways, like, Nobody at school was allowed to wear head wraps. Um, and it was just a lot of restrictions against like the clothing that girls wore um, and things like that. Versus boys. So, yeah. yeah. I remember you being very upset about the head wraps because that was like your head wrap payday. You were, you know, because that was the transition from having your locks where you took all your locks out and you started to wear head wraps. And so I feel like <laughs> that rule kind of came about because of you. I think, was there anyone else at your school wearing head wraps like you to that degree? To be honest, I think that I started it because the head wrap rule was in place, but it, people weren't like enforced like I came to school with it and nobody kind of like enforced the rule and made me take it off and so I was like wearing it every day and then like everybody else was like starting to do it because they realized that I wasn't getting in trouble for it and so then everybody started to do it and then the rules started getting enforced. I had no idea. Look. She has been homeschooled since ninth grade and she is graduating at the end of the school year as a dual enrolled student. 
She has been taking community colleges since ninth grade. So when she finishes high school as a homeschooler, she will also be earning an associate's degree from the Community College of Baltimore County. As long as it may seem that I've been homeschooling, I admit that at times it could be a bit isolating as no one else in my immediate circle homeschools and I have never really had a community where my daughter and I fit in. So when I made the decision to center my dissertation topic on dual enrolled African-American homeschool students, I didn't realize how much I would be learning as I stepped outside of my homeschooling bubble. For starters, black homeschoolers are not a monolith. There are so many things we call our homeschooling practice. That homeschooling looks different and it, it's very unique to who your family is. So in my research, um, so I say that the homeschooling looks different and it's very unique to who you are, who you are, who your child is, who your family is, what your needs are, all of those things, okay? But as a researcher, I also know that to be true. So as a practitioner, as a homeschooler, I know that homeschooler, I know that to be too true. As a researcher, I know that to be true as well. The research will tell you that the reasons why black fa um, families homeschool are, are, are vast. Some of those reasons include environmental issues. Um, one researcher by the name of Rome said that environmental issues in the schools, from drugs to discipline issues of other children, and low expectations from teachers and administrators is one of the number one reasons why many families um, are choosing to, black families are choosing to homeschool. Another reason, um, racial intolerance, the work not challenging in the classroom. Um, researcher by the name of Murek interviewed families and found that black parents chose to homeschool when the school in which they originally had their children enrolled had issues regarding race or the work was not challenging um, their children. Um, Murek also found that parental experiences um, and religious um, background also impacted the the choice to homeschool. Um, so parents made decisions to homeschool and forego enrolling them in school sometimes based on their own experiences in institutionalized schooling or their want to emphasize religious training in their instruction. My study was unique in that it was not focused on the perceptions and experiences of black homeschooling parents, but really was focused on the children themselves and their lived experiences. My study found that the study participants felt their homeschool experiences prepared them for community college in five areas in particular. These five areas were cultural identity and awareness, time management, effective communication, coursework completion, and self-awareness of academic strengths and interest. The activities that the study participants reported as being linked to preparedness for community college are in this chart. Things that stand out are participation in co-op classes and workshops that focus on math prep, cultural identity, English prep, and career pathways, field trips to plays and museums, online resources like Khan Academy and YouTube, learning experiences during the summer, the ability to work on coursework at their own pace, whether at an accelerated pace or a slower pace, the ability to work in groups and extracurricular activities and leadership roles in sports, clubs, or in jobs. During a focus group with two of the participants and in interviews with all of them, I learned from them how they got direct and indirect messages from their parents when it came to how you treat other black people within predominantly white spaces and how you navigate spaces with a sense of self-awareness born from cultural awareness. One young person in my study credited her homeschool experience in an Afrocentric homeschool co-op as building her cultural awareness to the point that she often felt she had a better sense of cultural awareness and knowledge of her heritage when interacting with other black students at her college. This student who I called Bailey in my study indicated during the focus group that her parents told her before she started community college that it was not only important to have a sense of cultural identity when navigating white spaces, 
but to understand the responsibility in building relationships with other black students and that it comes with this acknowledgement. She said, my parents always encouraged me to be friends with the other black people in predominantly non-black spaces. But she said, even if it's not to be friends with them, just to be allies to these people, just because. She demonstrated a particular loyalty to other black students in predominantly white spaces, inferring a need to protect and shield each other from potential negative attention or action on the part of non-black faculty and peers. She went on to explain her point further during the focus group. Another student during the focus group offered her own perspective. She went on to share how her homeschooling experience never included a direct lesson on building alliances with other students based on their African descent. But she said, from listening to her parents have conversations about how new African-American co-workers were being hired in, in the workplace, she inferred that it was important to be an ally to other African-American students. It is easy to find stories about the positive impact of homeschooling black children. When you see the news articles on children who are homeschooled starting college at ridiculously young ages or doing amazing feats. But what I found most useful in my research findings was how the positive impact is psychological, it seems. And the self-efficacy that these children develop is useful to them in ways that, yes, helps them navigate a college campus, but also when it comes to decision-making and critical thinking skills. In closing, as I parent my dual enrolled homeschooler through her last year of homeschooling, I am personally reminded of the positive impact of homeschooling as I look around our house and see the plants she has tended to and grown for the past four years as she taught herself propagation and share a love of plants with her father and late grandmother, my mom. I am personally reminded of the positive impact of homeschooling when I see all of the books scattered throughout her room, books that weren't for a class or assignment I gave, but books she bought at the local thrift store asked me to purchase for her just because. I am reminded of the positive impact when I hear her debate her friends through her closed bedroom door about topics ranging from police brutality to the, to the presidential election. When she plans COVID safe meetups with her friends or decides to take the half mile walk to the grocery store to get the healthy food she has decided she wants to prepare for herself that day. When I see her practice self care and witness her developing a keen insight into who she is as a learner, as a thinker, as someone responsible for her own wellness and body agency. Without hesitation, I say that she is the embodiment of the positive impact of homeschooling a black child. Just a moment, I can't stop you.